All right, it's good to see everybody here tonight. We're going to begin. Uh, you, you might remember we've had a few, uh, you know, there's always time that goes between. We had a prayer service last week, but we're studying First and Second Peter. We're into Second Peter now. And uh, this is Peter's final message. In fact, uh, the book of First Peter, you remember, is a lot about suffering. He's preparing this church for suffering. He's teaching them and he's teaching us how to live godly in an ungodly world. And one of the realities that will help you to make it through is we just got to understand suffering's going to happen. And we have to have the right attitude about it, but God will be with you through it. That's what the message of 1 Peter was. 2 Peter, uh, this is written a few years later. 1 Peter was likely written right before the or during the time when the great persecution under the ungodly emperor Nero was taking place. This message from 2 Peter was written a few years later. And uh, this is right before, most people think, this is right before Peter, his death is imminent. He's going to be, he's going to be crucified upside down, tradition holds, giving his testimony for Jesus, remaining too true to Jesus throughout his life. So this is his, his final message that he's going to give. And uh, when you read the book, as I've done several times the last couple of weeks, read it a couple times today, it's a short little letter. But when you see words, once again, when you see words or phrases that keep repeating themselves, you know that's, that's him bolding and italicizing it. That was PowerPoint back in the day. That's what he's trying to say. This is what this message is all about. And I think this last, uh, sometimes in, in these ancient letters, the way, the way they got their point across, usually in the very first sentence, you know, usually when he'll say, Peter, an apostle, the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you, those kind of things, we tend to pass over those things pretty quickly. But we should not pass over those things. Usually he's kind of setting up some of his themes in the first couple of verses, and then usually at the very end of the book, they also remind them of some things that they have been talking about. One of the things that comes up over and over and over again in this book, as I was rereading it again today, are passages kind of like this right here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. He says, I consider it right as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. This was a church that needed to be stirred up. Do you all think that is applicable today? Yes. I think this, this letter is very applicable today because they had some things going on with them. They weren't necessarily, they weren't bad people. They were good people. But sometimes even Christians who are followers of Jesus can get complacent. Can't they and can't we? That was a problem then that Peter was concerned about. So he says, so I'm writing to stir you up. By way of reminder, I'm reminding you of some things. He repeats phrases kind of like that several times in these three short little chapters. Look what he says at the very end of the book. He says, therefore, after he's, this is when he's concluding, therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Here's what I want to ask you. As you look at those words from Scripture at the very end of this little letter, look at those words real closely, and I want to ask you, tell me from what he says at the very end when he says, therefore, which is because of everything I've said in this letter, and then he says this, tell me what jumps out at you there. What's he, what's he trying to impress upon this church? The devil's waiting on you. Be faithful. Grow. John talks about it in Revelation too, that that the, the people will come in, the evil one will come in, and even though you are a Christian, he will leave you astray by fear. Okay. I want you to look at this word right here. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned. Uh, I've read some documents, and I think they're accurate. This is very scriptural. You know, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that all, all Scripture is given by inspiration from God, right? And it's profitable, it says, for 
instruction, for encouragement, and then it also says for reproof. Sometimes a preacher or a pastor, sometimes they need to speak words of encouragement to their church, right? And there are letters in the New Testament where that's largely what it is. That's largely what 1 Peter was. That's not what 2 Peter is. 2 Peter is a letter of warning. You have been forewarned in what I told you in the free. It's a letter of warning. There are things going on in that church that he needs to warn them about. He says, be on your guard. It's easy for us to let our guard down, isn't it? To get, I think that's complacency. That was one of the things that was going on in their church that he was warning them about. So that you're not carried away by the error of the lawless. One of the other main problems going on in that church, there were false teachers who had arisen from within the church. And the things that they were teaching uh, were, were at the heart of Christianity. And he warns them, don't listen to these false teachers. Be on your guard so that you're not complacent and you're not listening to false teachers. So that you don't fall from your secure position. Now, it's, it's hard for me to read a passage like this and imagine, as you know, or if you don't know, you know, there are, there are those in our world, lots of people, lots of large groups of people who teach that, you know, once you're saved, your position is always secure and there's nothing you can do to, you know, to unsecure it. I don't know what you do with a passage like this. <laughs> if that's true, why does he say... Uh, be on your guard so that you're not carried away by the air of lawless so that you don't fall from your secure position. That doesn't make any sense to me if you can't fall. Am I seeing that wrong? Do y'all see what I'm saying? A passage like this and the whole book of Hebrews to me, which is a whole book of warnings, none of it makes any sense to me if that doctrine is true. Ken? Ken? Yeah. Yeah. If you can't be devoured, then why do you even need to be on your guard? It doesn't make any sense to me. And then he says, one of, one of the things that's big in this book, he says, you need to grow in the grace and knowledge. The word knowledge is another word that he uses repetitively throughout this book. And I'll, I'll show you here in a second when we get into the text. We need to grow. You know, as Christians, you know, every once in a while, and it's in our bulletin every week, and sometimes I bring it up on the PowerPoint, the baseball diagram, the Christian life is about movement. It's not, God doesn't want us just to get on first base, which is to be converted to Christ. That's necessary. That's the starting point. You have to get to first base and be converted to Christ, and that's what we as a church should be trying to do. But that's not all we should be trying to do. We should then be trying to help move people around the bases to an ever-deepening commitment in their relationship with the Lord so that they grow, as this verse says, in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One thing I don't understand, which I think, honestly, if you were here last week in our prayer service, I'm concerned about our church. I really am. More concerned than I have ever been in the eight years that I've been here. We have a good church, don't get me wrong. Lots of good people, wonderful people. Good church. But there are more people right now who are falling from their secure position than there ever has been since I have been here. And I'm concerned about it. And there's so many people I see who just have a, an attitude of ho-hum about Christianity. I think that's our biggest problem. Let me ask y'all, do y'all see that? I, I, for the life of me, I don't understand it. A Christian, if you're truly a Christian, if you really understand Christianity, you're going to want to do everything you can to know God, to know his will better, to live your life for him. And when you don't, when Christianity is not one of your top priorities, it should be number one, but when it's not even in your top five, which I see a lot of evidence of with a bunch of members of our church, I think you ought to really question not whether you're really even a Christian, which is what Peter's going to get at in this letter. You know, if, if Jesus hasn't made a difference in your heart and changed the way you think and live, did salvation really even happen in the first place? Because, correct me if I'm wrong, 
But aren't there some teachings in the New Testament that say if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation? And so if there's no new creation, what does that mean that probably didn't happen? Didn't Maybe you really didn't die to yourself and conversion really wasn't real. So that's the kind of things that he is warning about in this letter. This is his, his final message. Uh, and I think his main warning for them and for us, the, the thing that I see is really uh, that parallels is complacency. I believe in this church, right now in our time, I believe our biggest problem is complacency. And I want everybody to understand So I'm not talking about you. I mean, it's Wednesday night and you're in here. <laughs> and you're here every week. And I'm not saying that those of us who are in here and come all the time, I'm not saying we don't need to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Certainly we all do. But I'm, what I'm trying to do is stir all of us up by way of reminder that we need to be encouragers and spurring on our other brothers and sisters who don't get this. Is, is everybody following me? I'm trying to enlist and help as many people as possible, especially in this upcoming year. I think this is what we need to focus on. I was this week that I'll pass out to our elders on Sunday in the elders meeting. I was going, I've been paying close attention to this for a while now, but I really got specific, and Laura and I got together and made a list. There are 95 people, counting children, 95 who are members of this church, who are on our church roll. And that's all they're on, is the roll. They're not playing any kind of a role we rarely see them if we do it's on Sunday morning once every six weeks some not even that much and they do nothing 95 people that's the most it's ever been since I've been here I am not of the position to say well let's just let them go to hell I am not of that position. Let's try to reclaim these people. I'm not saying they're lost, but I am saying what Peter's saying. You're in serious danger. Because if your life, the way you live, and the way that your life is ordered and prioritized, if it doesn't reflect that Jesus is number one, something, you're in danger, according to Scripture. And so I think we need to be very, very concerned about that yes well they need to see that Christianity is a prior is the number one priority more than anything in our life and I'm not saying attendance means all, it's not just being here counts for everything but it certainly counts for something right it shows your heart a lot, I think. Well, this we come here to worship. I would say God's with us all the time. But we do. it is important, you're right, Gwenda, for us to come when it's time for us to gather together to worship. Something transforms us when we meet together, when we sing, when we take the Lord's Supper together, when we hear the teaching of the Word of God. If we're not here, we're not hearing those things. Where are you going to hear that out in the world? It's important for, those, for us to be here for those kind of things. I think what Peter was struggling with, which is what I see in our culture, uh, this is a word of warning, this is a word of an awakening to that church. He's trying to tell them, you know, Jesus can't be your Savior if he's not your Lord. And I think that's what everybody wants Jesus to be their Savior if they're in their right mind. Who doesn't want to be saved from their sins and not spend eternity in hell? Everybody wants that if they're in their right mind. But the truth, the, the fact of the matter is, Jesus can't be your Savior if he's not your Lord. The two go together. That means if he is not the priority in your life, then some saving really hasn't happened, according to what the New Testament says. The two go together. And so Peter gives them, and he gives us, the antidote for this stagnancy and complacency and also giving in to false teaching. And that's what this letter is all about. He wants to 
uh, stir up people to reclaim the, the people who have tripped along the way. And he was told by Jesus, you guys remember after Peter royally messed up, after he, you know, everybody else will deny you, but I won't, I'll be there, you know, and then, of course, he denied Jesus three times. Do you remember after Jesus was resurrected again from the dead, he told the women, you remember he said, go tell the disciples and Peter that I'll meet you in Galilee. And then you remember he met them along the shores of the Sea of Galilee and Jesus was cooking breakfast on the shore there. He had a charcoal fire. Remember, I taught a lesson on that. There's only two times in the New Testament where the word charcoal is used. One is when Peter was warming his hands over a charcoal fire when he denied Jesus. And then Jesus recreates the scene, you might say, when he has this charcoal fire going on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And he asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter was hurt by that. Jesus was wanting to see, you know, have you really repented? And, of course, he did really repent. And what he told Peter, on that occasion, he says, what I want you to do is I want you to feed my sheep and I want you to strengthen your brothers. That's what I want you to do. That's what Peter's trying to do here in this book of Second Peter. He's trying to strengthen a church in the first century that he saw was waning. And the principles are still very applicable for us. Uh, one, one, one thing, I think, one little phrase that I came up with today when I was studying that I think he, that just kind of summarizes this whole, this whole letter is this. And Peter can identify with this. You know, this is his final message. Peter is unique, uniquely qualified to say this. And here's what he's telling them and us. You can still finish even though you have fallen. Now, who, who, did, who didn't... I mean, he fell as bad as anybody. And what he's saying is, you can finish even though you've fallen. You can fall and still finish. Some of them needed to hear that. Some people now need to hear that. See, one of the things Satan does is, Satan, you know, for lack of a better word, when I say talks to us, I don't mean verbally when we hear his voice or anything like that. Y'all know what I mean. But, you know, we hear these inner, inner in our head. There are a lot of people. I have people tell me this all the time. They think they've messed up so bad or sinned so bad that they're just doomed. That, that's not God telling you that. That's not the message of Scripture. That's Satan in your mind telling you that you're no good and you've fallen so bad that you can't be reclaimed. Peter says, oh yeah, you can. You can fall and you can still finish well. And so he's trying to, he's trying to compel this church to finish well. That's what I think we need to focus on in this upcoming year for our church. I think we have a bunch of people, a bunch. As I this this week, I came up with a list of ninety-five people. They're in the process of not finishing well. Now, what their eternal salvation is going to be, I'm not the judge of it. But I certainly, I mean, I do not want to stand before God on the day of judgment. Say, you know what? I I let all my hobbies and all my other interests and everything else take precedence over you. I don't want to do that. Do you? <laughs> I know we're not saved by our works, but I want to say, you know, I worked hard for you because I thought it was important. And I want to help us who are the core of our church to, I want to sound an alarm. This is what we need to focus on to spur our brothers and sisters on this year to love and to good works. Yes. Well, especially one of them, you know, as you know, I've taught this lesson before, too, and it's a fascinating study. You know, he writes those letters to those seven real churches and to five of them, he says, you know, you're doing this really good, but you need to change this to one of them. He only has good things to say, nothing bad. And one of them, he doesn't have anything good to say. That's the very last one. And their problem was not immorality, their problem was not false teaching or any of that stuff, or idolatry. Their problem was they just didn't care. They were complacent. And he says in chapter 3, verse 16, So therefore, because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. The word spew is a nice covering over what the Greek word means. It means you make me sick to my stomach. Apparently, what, get, what makes God sicker than anything, even over 
idolatry and immorality and those other things that somebody just doesn't care. What do you do with somebody that doesn't care? What do you do with them? Yeah. You know, we need to make sure we don't become those kind of people. We need to be on fire for the Lord our whole life. So let's go to the text, chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, first couple of verses. Here's my problem. Let me tell you what my problem is today. You know, I love reading and studying the Bible. Today, a lot of times on Wednesdays, I stay at home because in the office there's a lot of activity. And, you know, a lot of times there's coming and going. So a lot of times on Wednesdays, I stay at home to do some deep study. Man, today I got some re- I got deep into stuff. I found some real good sources. And I was reading and studying them. You know, I st- I'm studying this morning. I start like 8.30 in the morning. I look up and it's 11.30. <laughs> I'm in there for like three hours just deep. And I'm like, this is great stuff. My pro- Here's my problem tonight. I could... Uh, I could preach, I'm going to have this divided into four segments of verses. Verse 1 to 2, verse 3 to 4, verse 5 to 9, verse 10 to 11. I could preach an hour sermon on each of those segments. Easy. My problem is, what am I going to cut out here? There's so much good stuff in here. So I'm going to go through some of this kind of quick, but I want to get to the main thrust of it. So feel free to make comments as we go through here. But this is rich with things. Look what he says in verse 1. Simon Peter a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. I want you to notice something. The first two words, it's real easy to pass over this introductory stuff. He says, Simon Peter, question. Why does he call himself by both of his names? What do you think? You know, he was named Simon originally, and he was renamed Peter. Here he says both. Why? What do you think? Okay, somebody else, help Roy out. Why does he have, Scott? Scott? Yeah. I'm Simon, you know, he was renamed the Rock, and he's admitting here, you know, sometimes I'm not all that rock-like. And we've seen that in his life, and we all know. We're like that too, aren't we? But God renamed him, Jesus renamed him, who is God? Jesus renamed him, Peter, you are the Rock. Though you are going to be the one of the main cornerstones of the church in the first century, and truth of the matter is, just like us, all of us, there are days we're really rock-like and we're solid in our Christian walk, aren't we? Everybody in here is. I know you are. I've seen you, and we all have other times when we know, man, we're Simon-like. <laughs> we're not very. We're not very rock-like, and so he says, Simon Peter, servant. Christianity is a servant religion, an apostle. There are no apostles, contrary to what some say, there there are no apostles like there were in the first century, meaning people who were hand-picked by Jesus and they saw him crucified and resurrected from the dead. There are no apostles. There's no apostolic succession like some false teachers say today like that. But we're all apostles. This word simply means somebody who's sent on a mission. We're all sent on a mission. And our mission is to testify to Jesus. And then he says, I wish I didn't have to wear these glasses. Those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. The only way that we're saved, the only righteousness we have is through what God has done for us. But notice what he says right here. The the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Notice he calls Jesus God. Now, I have a friend in Alabama, my best friend, and we every time we get on the phone, it seems like, when we get into a theological discussion, and we're good friends, we have good discussions, but he doesn't understand this. He says, well, Jesus is not God. Jesus is God's Son. I'm like, I understand that, but you don't understand the way they use words in the Bible. Right here it says, I'm looking right at it, those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, he calls Jesus God. Was Jesus God? 
Yes. I understand there's God the Father. That's why Jesus calls him my Father, because he is his Father. They're three separate persons, but they all are of the essence of God. They are all God. Jesus was God walking around down here in the form of a human being. He was God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace go together. You can't have peace without grace. That's why it, it just blows me away why grace has been such a, it blows me away why the teaching of grace has been a controversial thing. I don't, un, I don't get it. That's about as biblical as something as you can preach about is grace, right? And he says right here, grace and peace be yours. The truth of the matter is, we can't have peace with ourselves and we can't have peace with God without grace. We need God's grace. That's the only way any of us are ever going to be saved. Now, let me show you something else that's fascinating. In verse 2, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of our God, uh, of God and of Jesus our Lord. Uh, I, I want to make this disclaimer. I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. You can understand the bible and god's word if you can't read greek yes you can we have really good accurate translations a whole bunch of them all the ones you guys use you know all the you know 10 or 12 really good ones that we have they're accurate they're readable they're reliable they're understand you can understand god's will from that yes you can there is a reason when you go to preacher school or Bible school in a college or something like that, there's a reason why they make Bible majors take at least two years of Greek. I took three. There's a reason why they do it. Here's why. Because the New Testament was written in Greek, and you can understand it better, and you can see things in Greek you can't see in English. And this is one of them. In verse 2, when he says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of, of God and of Jesus our Savior. This word knowledge is a, the, the normal word for knowledge in the New Testament. Listen to these words. The normal word for knowledge is a Greek word called gnosis. We've probably all heard, or most of you have, the Gnostics in the book of 1 John especially gets the word gnosis comes from that, means knowledge. They were saying you had to have some kind of special knowledge to be saved. John says, no, you don't. You need to know Jesus. That's what you need to know. This word is not the word gnosis, it's the word epinosis. There's a three-letter preposition before it, and that heightens it. And what this word means, this word knowledge, he doesn't mean head knowledge. Uh, this is a personal kind of knowledge. To use an illustration, it's the difference between uh, knowing a person, knowing some facts about a person, for example, uh, let me just, you know, for example, like Donna. You know, I know some facts about Donna. Her name is Donna Powers, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I know some facts about Donna. But I don't really know Donna. Now, my wife, I don't just know some facts about my wife. I know my wife. That's the difference in this word right here between just the normal word for know. He means right here, he says, uh, the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge. It's through the personal knowledge. The only way that any of us are saved is by having a personal relationship with Jesus. You might remember Jesus said one time in John chapter 17, verse 3. See if this rings a bell. He said, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is, he didn't say, this is eternal life that they might know some things about you. That's not what he said. This is eternal life that they might know you. So it's this personal experiential knowledge that he's talking about. Having a personal uh, relationship with God. That's where grace and peace is found at, is in that relationship with him. So stop right there. Any questions or comments? Roy. Well, there, God, let me, how do I explain this? 
there's, there, God is in three persons. Jesus is a separate person, and by person, you know, I don't mean like us. You know, God is a spirit, the Bible says. But uh, separate personalities, you might say. There's Jesus, the Son. There's God, the Father. Jesus is also God. God, the Son, God, the Father, and God, the Holy Spirit. Three distinct personalities, but all have the attributes of God. All three are God. Yes, Jesse. Right. And, you know, I, I don't know. I've heard all kinds of analogies. And, you know, my friend and I on the phone, when we talk about this, he, you know, we, uh, there's, there's all kinds of places in the Bible. This is one of them where Jesus just flat out calls himself God. That's why they crucified him. He's called himself God. And he was. That's exactly what he was. They understood him right. He thinks he's God. Yeah, he did. And he was. He was right. That's who he was. He was God. And they thought that was blasphemy. But uh, anyway, okay, look in verse 3. His divine power, stop right there for a second. I never noticed it. I've read Second Peter a hundred times in my life. <laughs> I noticed it today. I'm like, I, I never noticed this. His divine power. He's calling Jesus divine. He's just in passing, but we miss little stuff like that. He's calling him divine. He is. His, talking about Jesus, because that's who he was talking about right before this, his divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life through our, here's that word, knowledge again. That's that word epigenosis again, that personal knowledge. Through our personal knowledge of him, personal relationship with him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And through these he has given us his very great and precious promises. So that through them you can participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world that's caused by evil desires. He wants them and he wants us to know something here in verse 3. God has, we already have in our possession, God has given us everything that we need to be able to participate in the divine nature. Now, you can go too far with that. He doesn't mean that we can become divine. You know, there's some false teachers that teach that, that you can be the God of your own world and you can become divine and all that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, though, that we can be godly. We can live godly lives the way that God wants us to live. Not perfectly, but we can live lives that are very pleasing and we can participate in the divine nature when he says. And he says, there's nothing else that we need that we don't already have. God has given us everything, he says, that we need uh, to live a life of knowledge according to him who called us by his own glory and goodness. He's given us all these great and precious promises. Let me stop right there on the promises. Why do you think he talks about promises when he's trying to tell them, you know, God has given you everything you need to live. You can live in a godly way. Why does he think he, he talks about promises? God always keeps his promises. Ken? They needed something to look forward to, look forward to. You know, we sing a song sometimes, standing on the promises. One of the things that will keep you going is if you have hope of the promises that God has made to us. That, that'll keep you going. See, we all have the promise, that, and he's going to talk about it in this letter. The promise of the second coming of Jesus. There's a promise that one of these days he's going to come back and he's going to make everything right. This world is so messed up and there's so much heartache in this world. You know, it, it broke my heart the other day when I was talking to Raquel just very briefly on the phone. You know, she was sobbing and understandably so. I hate it that bad things, horrible things like that happen to people. There's just terrible things that happen to people all the time in this world. If you can see and if we can understand the promises that God has waiting for us, that one of these days, and this is not a myth, this is not a fairy tale, it's real. Heaven is real. I, I just started reading a book this morning. Y'all have heard of those books, uh, The Case, Lee Strobel wrote these books called The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith, The Case for the Creator, The Case for Easter. I read all those, and I found out this week when I was doing some research online for some curriculum, I'm, there's one called The Case for Heaven. I'm like, oh, I better get that one. So I started reading that today. If you understand that there really is a heaven, 
and it's real. These are not myths. These are not fairy tales. There's credible evidence for it. The promises that God has made to us, these things will, will keep us going through this life where there's so much difficulty. He says he's given us everything we need for a godly life through the knowledge, that personal relationship that we have with him who's called us by his own glory and goodness. Notice he called us by his own glory and goodness. He didn't call us because we were good enough. That's not why I'm saved. That's not why you're saved. We're saved because he called us by his own glory and goodness. And through these, he has given us great precious promises so that through them we can participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world caused by evil desires. So in verse 5, he starts talking about, okay, here's the, here's the blueprint on how you get to heaven. And once again, y'all know this, but we need to be reminded. He's not talking about here's how you work your way to heaven. No. We don't work our way to heaven, but there is work for us to do. Right? I think it's kind of ridiculous, this, uh, you know, this ongoing debate that people have about, you know, this, quote, disparity between faith and works. There really is no disparity if you understand it right. We're not saved by works. Right? We know that. The Bible teaches us. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, so that no one can boast. We know that passage in Ephesians 2. We know that. We're not saved by our works. We're not, no matter, we can't do enough stuff to be good enough to live with God. We're saved by grace. But the only kind of faith that is a saving faith is a faith that works. We're not saved by works, but we are saved for works. And so he begins here in verse 5, and he's going to say, you know, if your faith is real and it's genuine, Here's what it's going to look like, or this is what you should aspire to. If you'll, if you'll be diligent in these things right here, this will assure that you, that you don't become complacent and you don't get off the road and you don't lose your stability in Christ. So he says in verse 5, For this very reason, make every effort. Uh, let me stop right there. Once again, we're not saved by our efforts. We're saved by Jesus. But it takes effort on our part to stay true to Jesus. Wouldn't you agree with that? It can't, I, I remember reading, I, I let Tyler borrow some books every once in a while. Not too long ago, I read, let him borrow a commentary on Romans. He was teaching the youth group. And I told him, I said, now here's the thing. And this is true with every book except the Bible. There's good stuff in here. And when I read a commentary, I told him, I said, you know, I, write, I read it with a pen, and I write, and, I, and I'll say, this is really good. And then I'll say, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, <laughs> you know. I said, so just kind of, you know, ignore my writing. But he has some really good stuff in here. But I said, he says some of the dumbest stuff you've ever heard in your life. And one of the things this one writer said was, he said, what do we have to do? What do we need to do? We're saved by great, God's grace. And I said, I agree with that. He said, what do we need to do? And he said, absolutely nothing. This is a well-respected, universally known, great Bible scholar. What do we need to do? Nothing. And I wrote in the margin, that is stupid. <laughs> That's ridiculous. He says right here, make every effort. And he's going to talk about, here's what you need to do. You need to add to your faith goodness to goodness, knowledge. And this word knowledge, remember I talked about knowledge, epigenosis before? This is not epigenosis, this is gnosis. Here he means you need to add intellectual understanding. That means you need to study. Let me stop, let me stop right here. Not going to take a poll, but what are your personal study habits? What are your study habits? Are you growing in your understanding of who God is? Guys, this is not hard. It's really this simple. If you read the Bible and ask for God's blessings through prayer to understand it, and you do it day in and day out, week in, week out, month in, year in, over time, you'll get it. If you don't, you won't. It's that simple. There was a time in my life where I couldn't even find the book of John. The book of John. I'm not talking about Zephaniah like I'm ever going to find that. The book of John I couldn't find. You can go from that 
to being pretty familiar with it, but it comes in every day reading and studying. That's the knowledge. That's what he's asking us to do. He says, I want you to grow in that way. Grow in, uh, add to your faith. It all starts with faith. Add goodness, goodness, knowledge, knowledge, self-control. What's self-control? Okay. What is it? What is self-control? Don't stray off the road. Moderation. It's moderation in good things. They're like, for example, eating. We like to eat, don't we? There's no, it's good to eat. You have to eat. But gluttony is a sin. Moderation in good things. There are a lot of good things, but moderation. We have to have self-control. We don't need to let other things control. We won't let, need to let things or habits control us. Only God. Yes, Albert. Yeah, knowing where the boundaries are and create boundaries for ourselves. Now, you brought up a good point right there, Albert, boundaries. Because, see, <clears throat> we all know, we know ourselves, don't we? I know what my areas are where I'm, where I'm most likely to not have good self-control, and you know what yours are. I need to put boundaries there. Like I've mentioned to you before, you know, some people struggle with alcohol, and they need boundaries. You, I don't need any boundaries for that. That doesn't tip me in the slightest. But some people it does. I mean, it really is a struggle for them. I don't understand it because I don't have that struggle. But I have other struggles that I do need to put. I need to put the intentional boundaries there. And you know what yours are. Because we don't need to let anything master us but the master. Steve? Well, I mean, we all need boundaries. I mean, we know what, I'm not saying imposing some ungodly boundaries. Certainly our boundaries that we impose upon ourselves need to be in accordance with what the Word of God says. I'm just saying that we all know ourselves, and we all know where we need an extra measure of limitation that we need to place upon ourselves. Yes, Wade. Yeah, and I think those things that you mentioned, being slow to anger, controlling our tongue, watching what we say to people instead of lashing out at people, just kind of keeping our tongue quiet, those are things we all need help with. Uh, he says, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. That word uh, mutual affection, or your you might have a version that says brotherly kindness. Let me just mention this and then we'll close. This word brotherly kindness means treating others, treating everybody as if they're family. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. We all know that our family is special to us. Your brothers and sisters, your mother and father, your children, your husband, your wife. Family gets special consideration that you don't treat other people that way. What God is saying here is, here's what I'm calling you to. This is a high calling. I am asking you, I'm calling you to treat everybody like their family. Now, how would that change everything if we all did that? Man, that would change all kinds of relationships all the time, wouldn't it? He's saying, I'm calling you to treat everybody with this brotherly kindness. Uh, we should have the kind of relationships that are so different from the world that where we have absolute loyalty to one another. You know, it, the way it is nowadays, uh, so many people, you know, they get upset with people over the most mi minute of things. And yet in, in family, if your family, I know they're really dysfunctional families, but in a normal family, uh, you know, let me, let, me just put it, let me just put it this way. I'll just use our family. You know, we have a little family, me and my wife and my, uh, uh, my daughter. I know she's married now, but I'm talking about when she was in our house, okay? And still now, 
She's our only child. She's our family. You know, she's done some things that have made me mad before and made, done some things that made Laura and I like, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You have a son or daughter the same way. But you know, what would it take for me to disinherit her and to treat her poorly and to not have anything to do with her anymore? What would it take? It would take something absolutely astronomical. And yet, so many people get offended over nothing and won't have anything to do with anybody over nothing. And he's saying, I'm calling you to treat each other and deal with each other like family. And if we all did that, it would make all the difference in the world. All right, I'm going to stop right there. He goes on and on. We'll finish this up next week. But uh, he, he's calling upon us. He's calling upon us to have these kind of character traits, to grow in these kind of ways. He's not saying that we're all going to get there 100%, and he's also not saying this. He's not saying, okay, I get, I get this one done, I got that one, I go on to the next one. These are things that all kind of, we're working on all of them at the same time, right? And they're all interconnected with each other. But we have to be growing in our relationship, in, in, with our relationship with the Lord. You know, we may not be where we want to be and where the Lord wants us to be in any of those areas. But we need to be a lot farther along than we were when we became a Christian. You know, y'all probably know, and I'll quit here because we're right at 8 o'clock. <clears throat> Patience is not my strong suit. My wife, here's, here's what I think happened. When God was passing out patience, you know, when we, before we were born, when he was passing out patience, when he got to my wife, he tripped and dumped the whole bucket on my wife. The most patient person, that, here's how patient she is. We can be, you know, when we drive to our house three miles uh, north of town on 34 every day, every day, every day, I get, the speed limit is 55 miles an hour. I get behind a person every day who drives 40, every day. And it bothers me. Now, I don't flip out and yell and scream at them or anything like that. But here's my wife. It doesn't bother her in the slightest. It just, in fact, she's one of the ones driving the <laughs> 40. doesn't bother her to things like that. Don't even face her. So that is not my strong suit. However, I'm better than I was, right? Should have seen me. 30 years ago when we got married. Uh, so there is growth and development. There's still a room for a whole lot more. And we're all like that. As long as we're seeing progress and we see the need to grow, that's the thing he wants in all of us. We want to be growing in our relationship with him. Okay, be reading and studying Second Peter, this first chapter for next week. We'll continue here when we get together next week. Let's close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. We can open your word and read and study and learn the kind of people you want us to be. As we leave here, help us to please you and honor you by the way that we live and think and act and treat other people. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you all for being here.